For 38 years, Threads has offered inspiration and instruction for sewers everywhere. Now is the time to get your copy of the 2023 Threads Magazine Archive. Available as a digital download or via USB, the archive includes nearly every article and department from Threads' rich history. The archive's search function enables you to find the information you need quickly. Visit tauntonstore.com to order your copy of the ultimate sewing resource. Welcome to Sewing with Threads, the monthly podcast with the staff of Threads Magazine. I'm your host, Carol Frazier, and my guest today is Mary Grabenstatter, owner of the sewing subscription box service Needle Sharp. A lifelong crafter, Mary only came to sewing in her 30s, but immediately fell in love with it. In 2017, Mary opened Needle Sharp, a monthly subscription sewing box service that offers curated garment projects as well as fabric and patterns. The company's number one goal is to make it easier to sew beautiful clothing. Their subscription boxes streamline everything by taking the headache out of getting all the supplies you need for a sewing project and putting them in one place so you can focus on the best part, the actual sewing. Welcome, Mary. Hi, thank you for having me. It's very nice to meet you. We had a nice talk yesterday, and I'm looking forward to talking with you a little bit more today. Let's start out by having you describe a little bit what your subscription service really supplies to a sewer. So uh, the way it works, every month I have a different theme. So one month might be wide leg pants or another month might be cardigans or skater dresses. And then based on that theme, I pick three different patterns and three different fabrics for each pattern. And once you pick your fabric, I pick the thread, the zippers, the interfacing, the buttons, everything that you need to make that pattern. And I put it in a box and send it to you every month. That is really amazing. And how did you come up with the idea for this box? It was really because I was using Blue Apron at the time. And I loved Blue Apron, even though I knew how to cook and I could probably make a lot of meals by myself. But I just liked the ease of having everything sent to me and not having to think about what I was going to make next. And I noticed that there wasn't anything like that in the sewing world. And I spent hours and hours and hours online looking at different fabrics and kind of fantasy sewing projects. And I figured other people were doing that too. And maybe there would be a market for having everything planned for you and arriving on your doorstep. Well, I I actually think that makes a lot of sense. I mean, at Threads, we do the same thing. We do spend a lot of time online going through the pattern websites and the fabric websites and trying to put things together. And it is very time consuming. And while it's fun, sometimes it feels like you just go down that rabbit hole and never come back up. So you're saving everybody that that endless rabbit hole experience. Yeah. And you can start planning so many things and then have like 16 things to sew on your docket and you never get to any of them. Oh yeah. Actually, I hadn't thought about that, but that's really true. To have somebody hand you something and say, you know, we've thought about everything for you. You can just get going. That's really a a great service. Yeah. Well, so what about your background? What is your background that that really prepared you to do this? I mean, this isn't something you can be trained for. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. I, I sort of think that my background led to it, but it's very like, you have to think about it. Um, I was a science person in school, and I found that a lot of sewists are actually science people. And then I, I became a film person and a film editor and worked in the film business uh, for a few years after graduation. And then the 2008 financial crisis happened, and I had to pivot because the film jobs kind of dried up. So I started working in retail at Barnes & Noble. And for about 10 years, I, I worked my way through different stores in New York City. And kind of the combination of the retail knowledge and then the website knowledge and the technical knowledge that I got from the film business led me to be able to do uh, an online store for sewing. Did you set up your own website and everything, or did you have to bring somebody in for that? The first website I set up completely on my own, and I was told that it was very nice and very generic. And then about three years into the business, I hired another company to help me with it, which is the site that you see now. Well, so what have been your biggest sticking points as you've been working on your business? The technical side has been really difficult uh, because... 
because of the uniqueness of my subscription service, it's been really hard to get everything to operate properly. And that has been quite the headache, uh, not to go into too much detail. The other side has been just getting my name out. I I opened the business thinking, well, you know, it's a sewing world. Someone will find me and then people will like the product and it will grow. And that's not how the internet works. So I had to learn about marketing and SEO and all sorts of things that I didn't have to do when I was working for a very well-established company in Barnes & Noble. If you had to estimate what percent of your time is spent doing that kind of work, the marketing business stuff versus the more creative part of deciding what's going to go into these boxes. And then, of course, there's the section, which is packing and shipping, I'm guessing. How does it break down? Uh, packing and shipping is definitely the most time consuming. Uh, it's also the part I kind of like the best because it's very zen. You're doing the same thing over and over and over again. And you can you know, listen to a podcast or watch a TV show. But marketing is probably about 25 to 30% of the business. And I wasn't expecting that. I was thinking it would all be you know, putting together the projects. And that's it's maybe a constant background thing in my head. But the actual process of that is a lot smaller than I expected it to be. Hmm. That's really interesting. And and how do you come up with your ideas for what will be the themes and what patterns to go for the themes? What, where do you do your research for that? Uh, I'm actually about to do that now because I need to plan for 2024. I sit down a little bit farther out from the year and plan like the next 12 months. And I try to keep it somewhat seasonal. So you're not sewing a bathing suit in January but also kind of look at the trends and keep different different clothing types separate from each other. I don't want to do like four boxes in a row that are just pretty dresses, though I wouldn't mind doing that myself. But, you know, alternate between wovens and knits, tops and bottoms, outerwear and all of that. And I just, I have a running list of different patterns that I really like. And when I see a pattern, my head kind of dings like, oh, that is a tailored jacket. Let's put that down. Or that's a bodysuit. Or I start to categorize the patterns that I see as they come out. So even then, I can't even keep up with how many PDF patterns are coming out. It, there's a lot to go through. Well, I know that in your boxes, you send a printed pattern. So how does that work um, if patterns are only available as PDFs? Do you have to forego using those? I mostly do. I'm still trying to figure out the process of it. One day I'll crack it. But at the moment, I really lean towards the companies that have printed patterns. So that limits me to, to a lot of European companies, which still offer printed patterns. And then the you know handful that are in the U.S. and Canada, like Closet Core or Friday Pattern Company and stuff like that. So are they largely independent pattern companies? They're exclusively independent. I decided at the very beginning that I wanted to support the other small businesses. And I also think that they offer the variety of types of clothing that I would need to offer a different theme every month. Mm -hmm. And how do you deal with covering every size range that your subscribers might need? It's taken a little bit of an evolution. When I first started, I didn't really uh, make that a point. And then about a year in, I started offering an exclusive so curvy box, which was always size inclusive. And that was, I was trying to have patterns that fit up to a 61 inch hip. And so if you ever wanted to make uh, a box and know that you could fit into it. That was the one you could subscribe to. Six months ago, I decided to consolidate that and go back to only three boxes. So I add, I made the middle box always size inclusive still. So that will, I believe it's always a size 30 or the equivalent in a, in a letter size. Are you finding it relatively easy to find patterns that, that have an extended size range for everything that you want to do? For the most part, there are some very specific pieces of clothing that are hard to find. Luckily, Cashmereette and uh, Chalk and Notch and Friday Pattern Company always have size inclusive. I'm trying to think if there is one that I really struggled with. Oh, when I was doing bias cut, I really struggled finding a size inclusive pattern that was bias cut. Hmm. And for that, I went to Style Arc uh, in Australia. Yeah, yes, they do. I think um, Muna and Broad might have a, some sort of a little camisole type of thing, but it's it's a small garment and it may not have felt like 
enough of a, yeah, I a, a can't term. remember if that's bias cut or straight cut. Yeah, um, for, for, I, I know. I think I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure you can do it on the straight grain too. Anyway. Yeah. The problem with Muna and Broad is they don't have smaller sizes. Right. So if I right. want a zero to 30, I can't use them. Well, have you noticed any, any increase in the number of um, extended size pattern ranges that oh, the, over absolutely. the years? Yeah. Uh, when I first started, Closet Core didn't have extended patterns. Cashmere Out was only doing 12 to 28. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, Friday Pattern Company wasn't doing the 0 to 30 at that point. So a lot have come up. And there was a whole discussion on Instagram a few years ago about that. And so more and more are adding them. That That's actually good news. And I, I do get the sense that there are some companies that are moving that way, even if they can't extend all of the sizes in every pattern they have at once you know, they can start doing a few. Yeah. My ideal is that I don't even have to think about size inclusivity, that it just every pattern goes up to a 61 inch hip or higher. Yeah, no, I know, but that's not the case. I mean, I know this because <laughs> I was just researching a lot of patterns for our spring uh, fashion forecast that's coming out in, in the spring issue. And you do have to look if you're looking for a wide range of garment types, you need to yeah. kind of peek out there. Yeah, it's true. But, well, One day. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we will get there. I think that I think that the community will get there. There seems to be really a, a push, and I I do get the sense that the independent pattern designers are really interested in finding out who their customers are. And so that's another question I have for you: Who is your customer? I've only met a few of them, but I have done uh, a little bit of research. It seems to be a lot of people like me who are, you know in millennial age range and just wanting to sell their own clothes and really enjoy the hobby. I think I get a lot of older women who have, you know, they gave up sewing for a little while and they're coming back to it at older age or coming back to it in more of a, a structured way now that they, they don't have kids to take care of or they are retired so they don't have a job to do. And it's interesting trying to balance between, you know, appealing to a 30-year-old and appealing to a 60-year-old. So I try to find clothing that is kind of timeless and not super trendy, but something that could look good on anybody. You're, you're coming at this from your sense of what people are interested in wearing, which you find out from, I'm, I'm assuming, social media and various other you know, people on the street? How, how, who do you look for for your style inspiration? I do look, look for it on Instagram. Mm -hmm. I'm not a TikTok person, so I can't say I look there. And then looking at different um, clothing companies like Everlane or J. Crew. J. Crew was always my personal favorite for clothing before I started to sew. And to be honest, and it may sound a little, I don't know, self-centered, but I kind of just try to trust that I have good taste in clothing and that other people will like my taste. It's a little bit of a, an emotional leap, but it seems to be working out. Well, I think that's part of being, I mean, if you're a designer, that's where you come from, right? And in a way, you're, you're a curator, and that is part of being a curator is choosing things and finding your audience who trusts your choices. So it sounds like you're, you're doing it successfully. That's true. I guess like Diane von Furstenberg doesn't think, well, I hope people like my sense of style. Like she just does it. So that's right. More and, confidence and, and if people don't like it, well, they won't come to her. So it's just it's yeah. as simple as that. Yeah. Well, how did you even get into sewing? I, I mean, I introduced you as saying you came to sewing in your 30s, which is, um, I mean, it's not super late, but it's later than than probably your older customers, I would say. My mom had a sewing machine and made different like Halloween costumes. But the most I ever did was like put a piece of fabric through and see what different stitches did. Like I never constructed anything when I was a kid. And I went to a college preparatory school, so I didn't have any home ec or anything like that. That's not something that they, they assume you need as you get older, which is kind of a lie. And so I was a big follower of the kitchen blog. And on that blog, they posted like, you know, 12 things you can sew over a weekend. And I saw a dress that I really liked and I had a wedding coming up and I knew I was coming back to visit my mom and kind of just decided for the moment, I was like, okay, she's going to teach me how to sew. And I came home and we went to Joanne Fabrics and I picked out very bad fabric that my mom said would not work for this dress. <laughs> And I ended up picking out quilting cotton, which is very warm in hindsight. 
and made the dress together. And it was on an old Kenmore sewing machine from like 1967 that uh, did not warn you when the presser foot was up and uh, didn't have any different sewing feet. So I had to insert a invisible zipper on a regular sewing foot for the first time ever sewing a garment, which in hindsight was terrifying, but I did it. And at the end of the long weekend, I had a a really pretty dress. And also part of it was, uh, and I've spoken about this on my website, that my mom was diagnosed with cancer. So there was part of the decision making being, well, if not now, when? So I wanted Mm -hmm. her to teach me before she couldn't pass it on. Then I went back to New York City and started sewing on my own, bought the cheapest sewing machine I could find because I have a tendency to cycle through hobbies and I didn't know if I would stick with it. And eight years later, I'm still sewing. So did did you upgrade your machine? I haven't yet. That's my goal for this year. Um, I just went to a sewing retreat and the woman said that I have a toy and I need to buy a tool. So I'm going to try and I'm looking for a new sewing machine that will do a lot more. Yeah. Yeah. I, I recommend it. I think you will really, really enjoy it. I mean, even if you've been successful with your toy machine, you will really love having one that it feels reliable in a stronger way. You know, I think that'll give you like even more confidence in what you're doing. And yeah, I mean, and I, I can actually that. make buttonholes. <laughs> oh <laughs> yeah. That's, that's another thing. That's true. Yes. Definitely test the buttonholes first. If you ever listen to any of our podcasts about how to choose a machine, everybody's always saying test a buttonhole. That's going to be really important. So yeah, my yeah. machine does not like to make them. Yeah. So h- how much do you get to sew now? I see you have a beautiful red coat behind you. Our, our listeners can't see it, but it's an absolutely stunning red wool coat with double breasted with gold buttons down the front and a standing collar. And if I recall, it has little pleated insets down by the hem on the sides. It does. It's on my Instagram if people are interested. I sew in fits and starts because that's mostly when I have time and also when I have the energy and those don't always meet. Like I might Mm -hmm. have a week off and then have no passion to sew. I have been sewing a lot this month and last month and probably will calm down as the, it gets colder. I tend not to sew as much in the winter, but I get to make uh, maybe like five or six garments a year. (laughs) And if they're smaller garments, maybe like six t-shirts or something. I work from home, so I don't have, I don't get to do a lot of like the work wear that I used to get to make, or if I do make it, I don't get to wear it. So that's, there's a limitation there. Yeah. Well, in, in the, your selection of garments, what are you, what are you thinking about for the, for what your customer is? Are you trying to mix in things that are good for work or leisure or, or how do you break that down? Uh, During the pandemic, I really leaned into comfy clothes And now as people are going back to work or doing like a hybrid of work and home, I'm trying to maintain a combination. Some things that can be workwear or dressy or like if you're going to go out to a nice dinner or something like that, and then put in some other things that are just to wear around the weekend. So I try to keep a balance between the two so that it's not just a person who's working in an office who can get the boxes, but it's also someone like me working from home who can do it. Yeah. And I can even imagine somebody who's a, you know, a student maybe wants to make something that feels contemporary and fun, but isn't going to be, you know, incredibly old or, or stodgy feeling. So, yeah. Yeah. And every once in a while I go out on a limb and say like, I like this garment. Let's see if other people like it. For example, last year I did coveralls and boiler suits and I had no clue if people would like them and they ended up really, really liking them, but it was, it was a bit of a, a stylistic leap for me. Well, I'm glad. I, I do feel like things got, uh, the boiler suit look was was pretty big over the last couple of years. And maybe the pandemic was helpful for people because they felt like they could wear that at home, even if they were a little bit afraid to wear it out to the to the office. It's, it still seemed like something that, that folks were wearing. I've been seeing a lot of people wearing them. So, yeah. Yeah. So maybe I got right. So what have been your top selling boxes? It's always the ones, and it makes sense for getting a box, the ones that have a lot of different pieces and a lot of uh, specialty sourced pieces. I think my most popular box was blazers. And that does, Mm -hmm. you have to get shoulder pads and sleeve heads and horse hair and all sorts of things that people, you know, to buy horse hair, you really only need like a 12 by 16 piece for the coat, but then you have to buy a yard of it. So it's, 
having it pieced together for you like that is always very popular. Same with jeans and actually all sorts of outerwear. And then people are kind of loyal to certain pattern companies. I know that if I use a closet core pattern, people are really going to like it because people really like that company. Yeah. Yes, they do have a really good style. And I and I mean, from what I've seen, their patterns are, are really nice. I mean, they're attractive looking in their printed form and seem to be good to sew, which is yeah. really important. I've sewn quite a few of them. So your three boxes, is there a skill level difference among them? The the so essential, which is the the lowest level, is designed to be a little more user friendly if you're a beginner. All the boxes, to be honest, are confident beginner and above. So you have to be able to, you know, you've made a few garments and you want to level up to nicer fabric type of thing. It's not strictly like you've never made a garment, you bought a sewing machine, now what do you do? But this is the leveling up. And then each one goes to a higher level. So there's the sew select, which is the intermediate box. So you feel really confident. Maybe you're like an advanced beginner. And then the so indulgent is really the luxury box where you are confident in your abilities and you want to make bespoke clothing that you can have for, you know, a decade or more. There are a bunch of silks and wools and stuff in that. So, Why do you think that sewing resonates a lot with people these days? I mean, from your experience and from people that you've spoken to. When I first started, I or when I first started the business, I thought about the working with your hands aspect of it that, you know, we do everything digitally and we don't like sit down and just kind of work with our hands and make something that is a, is a physical product. You know, we we have digital photos and digital emails and, you know, it's nothing that you can actually hold in your hand. And I think that's a lot of it. And it's very meditative. I know a lot of people who do it because it's it's the time when they can like tur- turn off their brain and not worry and just do the task in front of them. And that's definitely how I work with it. It's It's an escape of sorts. Yes, I think that is true until, of course, you hit the bump in the road when you're making something and it's no longer an escape and you you need to run screaming from your room tearing your hair out uh, hopefully that's that when you take a breath and step away <laughs> that's right and actually that's a really important learning thing that i think a lot of people as you say people don't do a lot of things with their hands and they don't they therefore don't learn to deal with that kind of obstacle that they may that they may have to sort out on their own and that's not that's not the end of the world you know you just don't get frustrated or if you feel frustrated, find a way to calm yourself down and and then move forward. And then you have a nice piece of clothing to wear that you can feel really proud of that represents your style. So there's, there's so much to it that's really wonderful. Yeah. And honestly, I think making the mistake is the best learning experience. I remember my mom taught me to knit and I would drop a stitch or something and I would hand it to her and have her fix it. And the only time that I... and I started to feel like a confident knitter when I could go and fix that error and make fix the mistake and then go back and do it. Before that, I was just like a beginner handing it off. And so when you make a mistake in your sewing and you're able to fix it or problem solve for it, then that you get confidence instead of feeling like a failure. So do you offer customer support for people who get stuck with their sewing in these kits or do they, can they go to the pattern company if, if that's where their issue lies? It depends on the issue. Not a lot of people email asking for direct help, uh, though I'm happy to answer any questions if people, if before they purchase, they want a better description of the fabric or mm-hmm. something like that, or after I remember a few years ago, one person had a bunch of drag lines on her skirt and she sent me a picture and it was a knit skirt. And I was like, I think it's just too big. I think like, you know, you take everything in, work with the negative ease and it all will disappear. And that ended up working out. If it's something really difficult, I will refer them to the sew along. And the beauty of having uh, the independent patterns is there's so much support. You have sew alongs, you have videos, if there's an actual error in the pattern, which I know drives sewing designers uh, batty and it's a, their worst nightmare, but you can go to them and ask like, hey, um, are the pleats backwards here? Because that's not something I can answer. Right, right. Yeah. Well, I, I was wondering about that. I mean, obviously, 
you put out so many kits a year that you can't be expected to have sewn every single one and have taken notes about your experience with them. So yeah, I would love to be able to do sew alongs for each one, but it's, um, it's, uh, six different boxes every month because I re-offer three boxes in addition to the new boxes. And so I just can't do six different sew alongs in 30 days. So do you just set aside a box, a, a one of every box for yourself for the future? I, I don't. Sometimes if there is a little bit of fabric left over, I'll take it and maybe use it for that pattern, maybe use it for something else. The, the coat that I just made, it's actually a leftover from a Jessica Blazer box, mm-hmm. but I don't steal one. <laughs> I try to send <laughs> them all out. Well, I, I mean, I, I would think that you're working on your inventory not to have a lot of leftover. That That is the goal, yes, uh, which is why I sell fabric by the yard afterwards if I have any leftover. And, and what fabrics are you? do you lean toward mostly with the boxes that you've been um, curating so far? Because each month is a different garment, I end up with a lot of different fabrics. You know, one month I'm doing wool tweeds and the next month I'm doing silks and satins. I do tend to do similar colors. I try not to repeat colors too often, but I know that I gravitate towards certain things. So like a rosy pink, or I really like teal, uh, which you'll see repeated. So it's different substrates, but similar color stories. Each month I try to create a mood so that each month has a particular color story the way that a fashion line would. Mm -hmm. So if you look through my website on the, in the fabric, you can kind of see how it, it goes through because it's listed by recency. And you can see, oh, well, this was the, the brown month or this was the light pink month. I, I did notice that. Yeah. And that, that probably feels very good for people who want to buy the, the kits because then they realize, like, if I don't want to get the middle kit, I want the lower or the higher one. I'm not, I'm not getting far away from it aesthetically. They're still, they all kind of relate in some way. I try to keep it pretty cohesive and that there is like a vision for each month and like a mood. And, you know, I just did uh, robes and it's light grays and pale pinks and creams. So that's like something that's very serene and soothing and neutral and will put you in a particular mind space. And it's great for the pre-holidays. I always think that that, uh, well, you know, if you, if you read the Bird of style magazine they always do their lingerie and sleepwear in the probably november issue i think as just as though the winter holidays are when everybody lounges around yeah that's what i've been doing the (laughs) december boxes for the past few years have been pajamas and robes so so you can wake up on christmas morning or you know new year's day and just kind of sit in your pajamas And, and look good doing it yeah that's a great idea okay i had another question for you oh is it possible for someone to order one kit as a gift for somebody else through your site? It absolutely is. There's a little button that says, is it a gift? And if you check that, you have a choice of a one month gift uh, and then three months, mm-hmm. six months, 12 months, depending on how generous you are. So you can give one month at Christmas or uh, for a birthday present and it'll ship out to them and then cancel at the end of it. And so does that allow the person who receives it to select the particular box or do you, as as the gift giver, are you selecting the box? I mean, I'm assuming the first one, you might choose it. And then after that, if it's like a three month or 12 month, do you, do they get to go in and pick their choice? They do get to go in. And if you're trying to keep it a secret, you can work with us and we'll send an email later to them after you've already given the gift, but the customer, the, the receiver will have control over what they receive after the first one. And even then, like if you buy a box and you give it and the person's like, I don't like this color, we, we can work with you. That is okay. I hope listeners are paying attention to that because it seems like it's a really wonderful gift for somebody who is getting into sewing and is feeling a little bit, you know, I don't quite know where to go next. This is a wonderful way to help them take the next step into, into making beautiful clothing. Uh, and people who live in places, which uh, many people do now, where they don't have access to good fabrics and all the supplies that you need. I, I realize that you save so much time for people by getting them all the pieces that might take them four or five websites to collect, you know, to make one a moto jacket or, or a pair of jeans with hardware and things like that. 
Yeah, I myself, I'm, I don't have a lot of garment fabric stores around me. And I, I have the gift of having wholesale accounts, but to make like, a, I want to make another coat. And I don't want I can't buy 15 yards of fabric to make a coat. So I have to buy it through another store. And I ended up going to four different websites to get all the things I need for it. So Oh, yeah, there you go. I mean, hopefully, you know, where all those places are that you need to go to. I do. <laughs> Do you have any practical tips for somebody who's interested in getting sewing or just started and is feeling a little bit, you know, stymied or, or, or someone who's teaching a beginner? What, what, what's the best way to hook somebody in? The having a beginner mind where if you mess up, that's okay. That's a learning experience is always good. And if you make a pair of shorts and the, you can't wear them, it's not the end of the world. Like you learned something in doing it. I also think that looking at your own closet or looking at clothes that you really like can make a big difference. I was, for the past few years, I've been working on pants fitting and looking at the J. Crew pants that fit me really well and kind of examining them and see how the crotch curve is different on that versus on the commercial sewing pattern was really, really helpful and getting to know the fabrics that you like from your ready to wear clothing. Oh, yes. We had a guest once. We asked her, how do you match the fabric to the pattern? And she said, well, I tell people, you wear clothes, don't you? Use that information when you choose something that goes with the pattern. And every piece of clothing has a product label that will tell you if it's rayon or polyester or wool or merino. You know, it's very helpful. Actually, this leads me back. I wanted to ask you, since you sell kits that are to cover your full size range or the full size range of the pattern, do you uh, do you adjust the amount of fabric for if somebody says I'm going to want to do the size 30 versus somebody who wants to do the size 12? Or is it the same amount for every kit? It's the same amount. And I decided that before I even launched the business, I wanted it to be I never wanted someone to pay more to get more fabric. So I went to the other end and everyone gets the same amount of fabric and you can make the largest size and you're never singled out because you're a larger size. That's really excellent. That That uh, is a very generous policy to have, I think. Do you have plans to expand your business in some way? Uh, at the moment, I'm still... I- I would like to expand my sales and my reach and how many customers I have. That's yeah. really been the focus of the past couple of years, doing things yeah. like coming on the podcast and just getting word of mouth out there. Once that's pretty established, I have always thought about doing a brick and mortar or something a little more traditional. And then maybe, and this is very far out, maybe doing some sewing patterns. So that seems to be a very saturated market at the t- at the moment. I can see what you mean by that. Although, how long have you been doing this business? I should have asked you that at the beginning. Uh, November 15th is the sixth year anniversary. Okay. Yeah. So you now have quite a bit of experience under your belt with this and you obviously know what people are interested in sewing and therefore coming up with your own patterns is not necessarily a bad idea at all. It could be a good idea, but it, it just may be a very big step. It is a big step. Would... It's, it's a it's a whole different avenue, and it would it's kind of like a separate business from this one. Yeah, yeah. Well, I would like to say all I wish you all the luck in continuing to expand your business in terms of your your clientele and all. And it's been really great talking to you and learning more about your subscription boxes and your attitudes towards sewing and trying to help the sewing community who maybe feeling isolated or needing inspiration or whatever they get, you know, when they, when they buy one of these boxes, sometimes it's the sort of self-care aspect of it to receive this gift of somebody having thought about you and what you might want and need and, you know, being able to then take it further into the finished garment. Yeah. The tagline I came up with a few years ago was be so delighted. And that's really what I'm trying to do. I want you to open up the box and have it be like a little gift and have surprises in there. We always have a little surprise present in it and some candy, which some sewist children get instead of them. But I want it to be an exciting, delightful experience when you get one of our boxes. 
you sent us one to photograph for the gift guide that will be in the winter issue if people haven't seen that yet. And when I opened it, it really was so delightful. It was probably one of the first times I've sort of experienced everything being beautifully arranged for me and ready to look at it and understand what all the parts were and what I was going to do with them. And then there was, I think it was Tootsie Rolls and our photographer ate those. So yeah, every month is a different <laughs> piece of candy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I do try to, I had a terrible experience once. I had a mini anvil in one of our jeans making kits and I put Smarties in the boxes and the two, uh, the anvil demolished the Smarties. And luckily the person <laughs> was very kind about it. And I was like, oh no, it took out, it was just Smarties dust everywhere. <laughs> I have to laugh at the idea of sending somebody an anvil. Well, that's that's actually kind of a, a great thing to get in the mail if you need it. And then you can use it for the rest of your life. Yep. And it's a very cute anvil. It's like, uh, you know, only like four inches tall. <laughs> for, for, for hammering in rivets? Yes, rivets Is and, that and everything. All right. Well, that that's actually very clever. Again, thank you very much for speaking with us and good luck with your business. And I hope to talk to you again soon. And I'll be keeping an eye on what you have coming up next in your subscription. Can you tell people where they can find you online? On all uh, social media, I'm a needle sharp NY. And then the website is needle sharp.com. Okay. Yes. And I recommend folks take a look. It's it's quite enticing. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Mary. Thank you to our guest for joining us, and thanks to all of you for listening. Please remember to send your comments, questions, and suggestions to th at taunton.com. And please like, comment, and subscribe wherever you're listening. It helps others find our podcast. Until next time, keep on sewing with threads. <laughs>